We continue with our sermon series right now on the book of Nehemiah. A very interesting, interesting story uh, going back to ancient times when Israel, Jerusalem more specifically, had been destroyed at the hands of Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, then after 70 years of destruction, it would be rebuilt. The Jews, many of them, were carried off into captivity in Babylon. But then during the reign of Medo-Persia, after the fall of Babylon, would, many would return to build and rebuild the temple and Jerusalem. Well, Nehemiah was one of the Jews that did not initially return to Jerusalem. He stayed. He had a uh, position of prominence. He was the cup bearer for the king, King Artaxerxes, the Persian king, which meant he was an advisor, an influencer, one who was there with the king and personally tasted uh, every substance that would be uh, given to the king to eat or drink. And so he would be around the king a lot. Well, after hearing a bad report that Jerusalem laid in ruins, that the rebuilding had not gone well, uh, he was saddened. This was the place of his heritage. And uh, for Jewish people, I mean, a lot of us, we like to look, you know, in history and see who our ancestors were and, and where they came from and where they went to. And that's all fun. But, and that's interesting, uh, you know, for us today. It's been interesting for me. A, a few little twists and turns and unique stuff. But for me, it's just kind of an interesting uh, a thought of um, inquisitiveness. But for the Jewish people, their history as a people, they were deeply tied to it. And their national heritage. And for Nehemiah to hear that Jerusalem laid in ruins, it, it absolutely caused his heart to ache until the point the king noticed one day. Now, you were to always be happy and pleasant in the sight of the king, which when you think of an ancient king, you think more like a modern dictator. You know, some of the mean guys that you've, you've heard, you know, names like Saddam Hussein or, or Stalin or these, the, the, you know, some, some of these kind of guys. And so you, you, didn't, you didn't show up sad in the king's presence. And Nehemiah was. He couldn't hide it. The king was perceptive and noticed and asked. But Nehemiah was bold because he had been a man of prayer. In fact, we learn these prayer lessons from Nehemiah. Pray before you plan. Acknowledge God's greatness. Confess your sins so they don't hinder your connection with God. God. Pray God's promises, and then as you're actually uh, enacting what your plan is, is pray as you go. And so Nehemiah enacted those things, and he asked the king to uh, grant him a favor to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. This would turn into a 900 mile one way trip that he would then return from 12 years later. Uh, the distance is like walking from here to Washington, D.C., right? It's quite a trek. And uh, as we looked into this, we saw Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem, and he uh, began to take, uh, really just take stock, take inventory of what was going on, getting ready to lead this project. And we saw these life lessons for rebuilding in the, in the book of Nehemiah. He had to face his fear, and we talked about that. Prayerfully, he had to make a plan. He had to look at, really, what was in front of them. He had to define reality. That's an important thing for any building project. In fact, as we're uh, looking at the expansion that we have going on here, coming up in the near future at our church, it's one of the things we're doing is making sure we define reality. You know, at the end of the day, you've got to have the budget and the money that comes in. Everything has to equalize. You have to have enough supplies and everything has to work, right? You have to realistically... Not pessimistically, but realistically face the challenge. Nehemiah had to. Then he had to take action. We talked about how important prayer is. But that if all you do is pray, eventually you'll stop doing that too. That ultimately you have to pray and work, work and pray. You can't just pray about some things. Some things you... you I mean, this is not to de discount prayer. We've talked about that. You must pray, but you must sometimes take action beyond just praying. 
right? If Nehemiah had just prayed about the wall being rebuilt, it would still have stayed in the same condition, right? And then deal with problems. Problems will inevitably come your way, and you have to face those sometimes, and you have to be willing to pay the price. Uh, Walking 900 miles, giving up 12 years of his life for the project uh, to be there, and that was beyond the building of the walls. That only took them 52 days. Then they had to rebuild the people. Rebuilding buildings is easy compared to rebuilding people. Building up, yeah, absolutely. And so, now we look into the plan. Here we are, so that's a little background on Nehemiah. Some of you weren't here for every week of that. Some of you might have appreciated a a quick review. And uh, I've had people say, Pastor, you know, the week after the sermon, you recounted all the high spots and and you did it in two minutes. Why didn't you just share it that way and just have two three-minute sermons? Well, it helps to, you know, it helps to do the full book before you write the Cliff Notes version. So, anyway. So, teamwork. Teamwork is such an important skill to learn. And I've had the opportunity to work with some men that I believe are some of the best on earth today at teamwork. They don't play organized sports. They don't carry cell phones. They're called Amish. And when I was building something at the place, we'd have some of them come and work. And I've considered myself a good worker. Uh, We like to all think of ourselves that way, right? And I grew up hauling hay and watermelons in Mississippi in the hot sun and would go all day. But I tell you what, when them Amish fellers came to work, I was out there to work and I just, I struggled to keep up with those guys. They are manual laborers and they work. And the interesting thing is, it's almost like they're intuitive at helping out the other and what the other one's going to need next. And they're so into teamwork that, that if one person is doing a job and there are two people doing the job and it gets to where it's just one person's part, the other one doesn't sit down while the one does it. He literally will stand there with his hand on it because he's going to be there and be involved. Now, these aren't the Amish that live close to my house that have helped me, but I'm going to show you an example of teamwork. So you've heard of the Amish doing barn raisings? Yeah? Look at this barn raising. The barn was already built, but they raised it anyway. Look at that. They decided they didn't want to leave it where it was at, that it needed moved. So they said, hey, let's just have two or three hundred of our closest friends and family come over and move the barn. And so that's what they're doing. Can you see that good enough? That is a barn. The barn is moving. That is men. No no tractors. No big machinery. Men. Now you see two guys out there. They're shouting the orders. One's looking down the barn this way. And maybe the guys in the barn are shouting. Because everybody's got to know what they're doing. And move the right way at the same time. Talk about teamwork. But as great an example of teamwork as that is, and it is, Nehemiah has a a great example of teamwork as well. It's an ancient example, and we jump right into it in Nehemiah chapter 3. That is our main passage today. So when we talk about kids' sermon quiz, what was picked up and moved, apparently a barn was. As if you probably read that and thought, yeah, right, a barn? No, yes, a barn. And now Nehemiah chapter 3, our main passage today... As we go through Nehemiah, and this one's been one that I have wrestled with this week, and I'm going to share with you why. Nehemiah chapter 3, and uh, as we look here at this, I want to make it clear that Nehemiah had a simple plan. When it came to building the wall, it was a simple plan. Put everyone to work. Now think about that. And I want, are there any applications for us today? Put everyone to work. You know, when it comes to volunteer organizations, they say that about 20% of the people do 80% of the work. I would dare say it's more like 10% of the people do 90% of the work. Sometimes. And I'm not picking on the church here. I'm saying across the board, it seems like it can be more that way. But it's interesting, Nehemiah's plan was to put everyone to work. 
And I can't help but reach any other conclusion, going through our chapter for this week, that the message God has for you is that God has a work for you. Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 1, here it is. Then Elishabib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priest, and built the sheep gate. So Nehemiah's gone, he's pitched, he's gone to Israel, he's gone to Jerusalem, the, the city is in disrepair, the walls are broken down, he pitches the idea, it, 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 he has a, an envoy from the king, it's time to get to work, he has supplies, he has the, the, the things that are needed, and guys, it's time we all get to work, and the chapter starts with who working? The high priest. Now, if there was anybody in all of Israel that ought to have been able to sit there and manage, it should have been the who? High priest. But why do you suppose it starts with the high priest working? I, get, I don't get the idea that the high priest went to work on Tuesday and then everyone else went to work on Wednesday. They probably all got up the same morning and went to work. But it starts with the high priest. Why? Because he's wanting to make it clear, this is work for everybody. Okay? And so, it says here, Then Elisha of the high priest rose up and built with his brethren the priest and built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and hung its doors. They built as far as the Tower of the Hundred and consecrated it, then as far as the Tower of Hananel. Now one of the things you discover in Nehemiah chapter 3 is it goes through a list of all of these different people or families and what they did. It almost becomes like a wall of remembrance or a wall of honor. These people worked here. These people worked there. I remember going up to the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary in Berrien Springs, Michigan. And when you walk in, uh, actually before you get in, outside there are bricks. So you walk up to the sidewalk and then you walk on brick. And the bricks have people's names and a year on them. And I found the name Ron Atkinson on those bricks. What did that tell me? That meant that Ron, and Ron was a member of ours in Springfield, retired pastor, tremendous blessing. And Ron had, at some point in the past, when they were building that building, given a donation of a certain amount, and they had put a brick there with his name on it. And there were all, it wasn't just Ron, it was all kinds. Ron was the only one I knew. Now, I must admit, I never stood around and read them all. But I was actually surprised one day. I was standing there outside the building talking to a friend, and I looked down, and I saw Ron's. How cool is that? I took a picture of it, sent it to his daughter, and, uh, you know, just, just a something to do. And so, uh, that, that was a way to remember. Well, Nehemiah does that verbally here in Nehemiah 3. These people built this. These people did that. These people worked over here. These worked by their house. And so he's going through that and sharing. And it starts with the high priest working. Now we're going to stay in Nehemiah 3 for the duration, but we're going to use some supporting text. One will be Matthew 20, if anybody wants to look there with me. Keep your finger there in Nehemiah 3. And so in Matthew chapter 20, we are reminded of something very important. And it says here, Matthew 20 verse 25, But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. Whosoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. And whosoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to what? serve and give his life a ransom for many and so nehemiah 3 begins with the high priest and the other priest doing physical manual labor and they are building and it even talks about how they built this far and then they built a whole nother section and went beyond they were working they were working 
hard. And we think of work in the body of Christ. Look with me in 1 Corinthians 12, if you would like, and verse 7. We think of spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. Now, according to Scripture, every converted child of God, every Christian, every person that's truly given their heart to Jesus has at least one spiritual gift. But who is that spiritual gift there to benefit? It says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verse 7, it says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one. To who? Each one. What's another way to say each one? Everyone. Everyone. For the profit of themselves? No, of all. And so you have been blessed. I have been blessed. But not just to be a blessing to ourselves, but to be a blessing to everyone. And the church, okay? And so that's important to realize. Now, when we talk about the work of God, and we talk about spiritual gifting, and we talk about God has stuff that He wants us to do, how many of you have ever... Well, I won't ask you how many of you have ever used the excuse. How many have ever heard the excuse used? That's better. That's not my gift. Now, there's some truth to that. That we're not all, we don't all have the same gifts. But there are certain things that everyone is supposed to do. When you look at Nehemiah, they're building the wall, and there are people there that it wasn't their gift. You know what they did? They built the wall. I want you to think about that for a moment. When you read in Nehemiah chapter 3, there are people with various Various jobs. Now, some of the guys, it really was in their wheelhouse. There were some masons building those walls. And then there was everyone else that could have said, it's not my gift. That wouldn't have went over real well with Nehemiah. I mean, if you read the whole book of Nehemiah, he was kind of a a take charge kind of leader. Yeah, it gets gets interesting later when uh, some were not observing Sabbath properly and he threatened to lay hands on them. And it wasn't for ordination. And so, I mean, he was was a serious kind of leader in that that regards. But it's interesting here that um, there were guys in here that were... Well, let me read it to you. Verse 8. Next to him, Aziel, the son of Harhiah, one of the what? goldsmiths made repairs so was he used to working on big blocks or little pieces of melted gold also next to him hananiah one of the perfumers he made perfume made repairs as they fortified jerusalem as far as the broad wall And so it's interesting when we talk about spiritual gifts. You know, there are some things that regardless of your spiritual gift, every Christian is supposed to do. You're supposed to go to church. Yes or no? Now, did you know that some people can have a special spiritual gift for praying, but we're all supposed to pray? Right? Yeah. Some of us are gifted singers and some of us aren't. But we believe in congregational singing and everyone singing. And those of you that are good at it should do it louder so that the rest of us feel freer. You understand? Somebody said amen. Praise the Lord. Did you know that there is a gift of evangelism, but despite the gift of evangelism, every single believer is called to share their faith? Yeah, absolutely. And so, there are certain things that like the wall of Jerusalem, it is a task for everybody, regardless of your gift. So, you don't need to say, that's not my gift. One of the interesting things is, uh, one view of spiritual gifts is since the gifts are given to benefit the body, God gifts people when the gift is needed. Now, there's some people, it doesn't matter how long they sing, it's not going to get better. Okay? But, and that's okay. We all have a voice, we're called to sing. But, there is the principle that God would have you at times step up to fill a need and might part the water only after your feet are in it. So, God has a work for leaders, He has a work for you. 
Look in verse 12. I'm not going to read this whole chapter to you. Quite frankly, I'm not brave enough to try. Not out loud. I read it many times silently. But one of the things you discover in these 32 verses of Nehemiah chapter 3 is that it is not the place to go to find baby names. (laughs) Not today. And if you do, make sure you warn me well before a baby dedication because I will need time to prepare. But notice here in verse 12, check it out. You know, this is kind of one of those lists in the Bible. Before I read verse 12, how many of you skip lists in the Bible? Be honest. Be honest. Guys, I skip lists sometime in the Bible because I've given up reading through the Bible because of list. I was probably 12 years old. I'm going to read all the way through the Bible. That's great. I got into Leviticus and so-and-so begot so-and-so begot so I was done. I had a friend that was started reading through the Bible. He was in the Old Testament and he was dying in some of those lists. And so he talked to a Christian friend and the guy said, Oh, just go read the New Testament. Start in Matthew. Well, then he didn't know later if his, if his Christian friend either didn't know his Bible real well or, or was playing a joke on him. Because when you go to the book of Matthew, what does Matthew get right into? The genealogy, so and so, but he thought, this guy's played a trick on me. (laughs) But in some of those lists, even though they don't mean a lot to us because it's often not our personal heritage, I mean the Goldbergs married into the Resters a few generations back, so technically I'm supposed to have a little dot of Abraham's blood in here somewhere. But, but, for most of us, it... These genealogies don't have much meaning. But in those lists are oftentimes just a few little gems that are so, so worth it. If you've ever read the prayer of Jabez, that's one of those that, that, that's in the middle of a list. And in this list, there are some nuggets. So verse 12, check it out. Check it out. In this list of who built what, it says, And next to him was Shalom, the son of Halahesh, leader of half the district of Jerusalem, he and his who? Daughters made repairs. Now, this would have been in ancient times where that kind of work would be considered whose work? Man's work. But see, when we see that God has a work for us, we go to Nehemiah chapter 3 and we discover that when it came to building the wall, God had work for who? Everyone. Okay? Now, you can keep your finger here, but if you want, go with me to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. This will blow your mind if you've never seen this before. Acts chapter 8. And we've talked about the priesthood of all believers, the Protestant concept, the Scripture saying that we're all kings and priests unto God, that we all have a work to share our faith, that the great commission of sharing the good news and the gospel with the world, that we all have a personal responsibility. You all know that there's people in your circle of influence that would never come here a preacher preach. But that a word in season, or, or when they're having the worst day of their life, offering to pray for them, those kind of things, you can be there and be used of God and be a witness. But many of you may not have noticed Acts chapter 8, verse 1 through 4. Check it out. Now Saul was consenting to his death. This is after the stoning of Stephen. He had just died in the previous chapter. And Saul, that's before he became Paul, he is the persecutor at this point. He's the enemy at this point. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except who? So all the believers were scattered except the leaders. Did you get that? The leaders, the preachers, the apostles, they're apparently still in Jerusalem. But everyone else has been scattered. Now what happens? Read the next few verses. And it says this, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to persecution. That's why they got scattered everywhere. So avoid the persecution. Verse 4, Therefore those who were scattered, who was scattered? The preachers? The leaders? No, who? Everyone else. The people. The common believer, the layperson, if you will, 
I'm not, I'm not such a fan of that word. I know where it comes from in the Greek, but people oftentimes like to give a distinction between the clergy and the lay people. And the clergy do the ministry and the lay people observe the clergy doing ministry. And that's, that's a very Catholic principle. Protestants, we, we don't believe that biblically. In fact, the leadership gifts are given to equip the lay people, the body of believers, to do the work of ministry. They're to serve under Jesus as shepherds. Shepherds give birth to how many sheep? That's a horrible visual. (laughs) Shepherds give birth to no sheep. Shepherds help make sure sheep are in optimal condition for sheep to have more sheep. That is a biblical view. When a pastor is giving Bible studies and praying with people, he's actually serving a function of the laity. Because the laity are to do that too. When he's training the laity how to do that, he's serving in a pastoral role. Does that make sense? We also live in a day and age where people don't feel like they've been ministered to unless the pastor shows up. That's also something we've got to work through. Because each and every member of the church can do a visit and minister to someone in need. Right? Yeah. And so, we look here. You say, you're, you're, you're off track. You're meddling. No, I'm not. Read verse 4. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere, what? Now, the word preaching does not mean sermonizing there. It's the word for proclaiming. Okay? You say, well, I, I, don't, I would never proclaim. I've heard some, uh, some folks say that they would never proclaim the gospel, but they can proclaim when the chiefs win. You proclaim whatever you're excited about. Did you know that? That's how you end up talking. Have you ever noticed how weird it is or how unusual or strange it is how conversations flow from one thing to the next? And they tend to just flow into whatever is on someone's mind. And they go different directions because the two people are thinking of different things. Well, that's how witnessing often happens. The thing is, is if Jesus is sitting on your mind, you tend not to talk about him. So, reading on here, back to Nehemiah chapter 3. You say, well, if we're all called to share, we're all called to work, what what can I do? Well, I'm going to tell you, it doesn't have to be some huge thing to get started. I'm going to tell you a story, though. There was a, a football player. His name was Mike Singletary. You remember him, some of you, from back in the day? He was a lineman for the Chicago Bears. You know? Linebacker, okay. He was a, he was a something for the Bears. He was a big guy. He played football. And uh, he went to one of the large churches in Chicago, and they talked about how everyone ought to be plugged in and doing something. And so in this large mega church that he went to, they had a, a kind of a help desk, and it was there to, you know, for people if they wanted to volunteer, a volunteer desk. And so he went there, and I don't guess the person at the, at the counter knew who he was. Do, you know, if he had a u- uniform on, he might have been recognized, but just walking up there, he wasn't recognized. I mean, if they had recognized him, they may have said, hey, we want to get you talking to the youth. They would listen to a pro athlete. You know, that's a popular thing, right? But they walk up, and he said, yeah, I would, I would like to get involved and help out. And the guy at the counter said, well, we need able-bodied men to help hold uh, infants, crying babies, uh, in the nursery. And then for a moment he was taken back at that and thought, I don't know that that's my gift. But then as he thought about it, he thought, I'm an able-bodied man. I don't know exactly what he thought. He probably thought, I'm a pretty able-bodied man. I can do this. And so for years, while he lived in Chicago, he showed up when he wasn't on the road traveling and playing football games. He showed up and for one of the services, went downstairs into the basement and held the crying babies. You know what? He was was serving. He was being a servant. I'm sure he could have found a more prestigious position in the church. He probably could have said, you know, I'm going to go talk to the pastor instead, see if he's got something for me. Oh, Mike Singletary, please for you. We got something for you. No, no, not at all. He, he showed up and went downstairs and held crying babies. He served. I'll give you one. This is for every one of you. Those of you that have been here the, uh, longer than me, you remember me telling you about this. These are your 5 and 10 plans. I haven't mentioned those for a few years. They weren't getting the traction that I had seen uh, elsewhere. But I'm going to talk to you again about them today. 5 and 10 plan. You want to know how you can connect 
and how you can serve just walking in any given day. This congregation, the people here, the five and ten plan. Well, five comes first, doesn't it? So that's, that's, that we'll save the ten. Five, five plan. Here it is. That's five minutes. This clock stands for five minutes. The first five minutes after church, what you want to do is get out of here and go eat. Or what you want to do is talk to your friends at church. And there's nothing wrong with either of those two things. But if you want to follow the five-minute plan, what you could do is give those five minutes to Jesus. And when church ends, instead of doing whatever the first thing is that pops into your head, look around for faces you don't recognize and go connect with people you don't already know. That would be giving those first five minutes to Jesus. Now, I'm not saying you should actually set a timer and then you're talking to someone. Well, I'm like, oh, so you just moved here. You're going to go to university. Oh, that's great. Oh, time's up. I'm out of here. Uh, you know, don't, don't be that legalistic about it, right? But that's something every one of you could do that would make a difference right here at this church every single week. And there's nobody here that couldn't do it. Now, how many of you have ever been to stores and you couldn't find anybody to help you with anything or find anything. How many of you have been to stores and every employee that walked past you said hello? I have. There are a few out there. How do you feel? Is there a difference? This leads to the 10-foot plan. I know i got to set it on something because at about 6 foot without some support it falls in half. So that's, oh, I'm almost there. Right there. Whenever you're within 10 foot of somebody, just say hi. You'll be surprised. The day. Hey, Bob, how are you? Wait, are you close enough? <laughs> it makes a difference. It really does. Now, guys, I, I haven't always been good at that. And in fact, I, I can still have issue with it today. Because I, I can be very type A and task focused. I had a Bible worker years ago. I was doing a series of evangelistic meetings. And uh, I'm forgetting the name of the town. Something's wrong. I don't usually forget that. But I, I remember the story though. And the, it was a little bitty town in, it was either New Mexico or West Texas. I was the conference evangelist there for a few years. And my Bible worker and I and uh, the, the pastor were back behind uh, the big screen. And I needed him to go get something for me to get started. And I said, Leroy, would you go get such and such? I need it to get started. Oh yeah, no problem. I knew not to walk out because it was one of the first few nights of the meetings. And what would happen is people come into the meetings, they want to talk to the speaker. And so if I tried to go get it, I wouldn't be able to get there and back without coming across rude. And so I sent Leroy. And so Leroy went to get it, and it got time to start, and Leroy went back. And a couple of more minutes went by, and Leroy went back. And I walked and looked, and Leroy's out there talking to people. Now, with my type A and wanting to start on time and all of this, I was in the moment frustrated. I really was. And I, 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 had to, I, I sent the pastor, please go get it, and he comes back. And after the meeting, I'm like, Leroy, let's talk. What happened? I asked you to go get this, and, you, you, you know, and then you left me hanging. Well, I, I saw so-and-so, and I hadn't seen him for a few days, and I needed to speak, and then I... Leroy was a natural people person. He could not walk by people without talking to them. He's done a lot of good in ministry over the years because of that. Guys, five-minute and uh, ten-foot plan. The five and ten plan. I'm going to start reminding you of those again because they make a difference. I've seen them make huge differences for church. If you spend the first five minutes after church focusing on people you don't know, I know, even though I would, I would love it for it to be a Nehemiah thing where everybody in the church did it. I'm not naive enough to think that that's going to happen immediately. But I'm curious. Are there those of you that say, that's something I can do, I would like to do something, and I will do that? Would anybody like to say that today? Would you like to raise your hand? You'll, you'll commit to the five-minute plan. Okay. If just those of you that raised your hand do that, that is going to make a difference here in church. How many of you can say hi when you find yourself within 10 foot of somebody? Okay, that one's a little easier, right? Okay, and so we've got work for everybody. We got work for the bold ones 
And we got work for the ones that go, hi. And, and, and that's great. That's great. And so, we're going to leave these sitting here. Savannah, this is your clock from Target. I need another one if you want this one back. I borrowed Savannah's clock. Because I, I just use a phone these days. I don't have clocks anymore. My phone has taken the place of half the gadgets in my house. And so, as we look at this, God has a work for you. Now, here's one of the sobering things for me this week about this passage. I also looked up in the book Gospel Workers to see uh, what it would say about kind of this theme of, of uh, getting folks going and, and getting work happening. In some respects, the pastor occupies a position to that similar of the foreman. The owner of a large mill, Sister White's writing this and she recounts this story, the owner of a large mill once found his superintendent in a wheel pit making some simple repairs, while a half dozen workmen in that line were standing by idly looking on. The proprietor, after learning the facts so as not to be sure that no injustice was done, called the foreman to his office and handed him his discharge with full pay. In other words, fired him. And surprised, the foreman asked for an explanation. It was given in these words. I employed you to keep six men at work. I found six idle while and you doing the work of but one. Your work could have been done just as well by any one of the six. I cannot afford to pay the wages of seven for you to teach the six how to be idle. But many pastors fail to get the full membership of the church actively engaged in the various departments of the church work. If pastors would give more attention to getting and keeping their flock actively engaged at work, they would accomplish more good. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because... A hundred people going out and doing stuff is going to accomplish a lot more than one going out and doing it. In the short term, it's oftentimes easier to do it yourself. And uh, sometimes getting... There's another element to this too. And that is, as a pastor, you don't want to work the handful that you know will do whatever you ask within reason every time to death. And so you go do it yourself. My dad was in this situation. We, we joined the Adventist church from the Baptist church, and the pastor immediately realized that, that Bill Rester, would, if he needed something and he called, Bill would do it. He'd stop whatever he's doing, go get it, get it done, get it done for the church, and was excited to. About five or six years later, when it got to the point that the pastor was calling pretty much every week, sometime more than once a week, my dad said, Pastor, I've noticed something. There's a hundred people at that church, and I'm doing a lot more than most of them. And you know, I used to have horses, and I found that the ones that were easiest to catch were the ones I rode the most. And you've got another hundred horses in that congregation. You need to get you a good lasso rope and go catch a few more horses and let me rest. I tried to find a lasso rope this morning. I was going to try to rope some of you. But I, I called Ryder, and he didn't have one, and I asked around, and I wasn't going to go to the store and get one on Sabbath. But man, I would have loved to have really driven that illustration home by you know, trying to rope a couple of you right here in the sermon. I was going to, so maybe it's a good thing I didn't find the rope. But Nehemiah's plan was to rope them all in and put everyone to work. Now, our world church has an initiative that uh, does better in other languages and other cultures than in North America because TMI just sounds like too much information here in the U.S. But in our world church, total member involvement. And it's, I couldn't get around talking about this, uh, not that I wanted to, I mean it just was so evident in Nehemiah that the point is everyone needed to work. Everyone needed to be involved. You may have noticed, and I don't know how long it's been there. I know it's in this one. I know it was in the last one. I suspect it was in ones before it. But if you go right to the center of your Sabbath school quarterly, there's a thing recommending how Sabbath schools might consider total member involvement. This was brought to my attention again by one of our members just a couple of months ago. And I'm like, well, go ask, ask about it in your class. Maybe they'll talk about it. But ultimately, this is the idea that we don't just get from Nehemiah that God has a work for you. 
not just the elected officers of the church. And Nehemiah's plan was to put everyone to work. So everyone went to work. Look here with me in Nehemiah chapter 3. So everyone went to work. Well, almost everyone. Look at verse 5. Next to them, the Tekoites. These are the men of Tekoa, the people of Tekoa. Tekoa is down south of Bethlehem. Little be small place back then. The Tekoites, Tekoa, the, men, the people from Tekoa made repairs. But their nobles did not put their shoulders to the work of their Lord. The work of their Lord, I thought they were just building a wall. When God's people have a work to do, it's the work of the Lord. Notice their nobles did not put their shoulders to the work. Now, you know, you know Nehemiah is probably not thinking too favorable about this. He starts his chapter off with what the high priest is building. Right? And guys, you know, in the history of, of Israel, when you didn't have a king, was there any position really higher than high priest? In this day and age, the high priest, that would have been the highest position. And the high priest, he starts off with what the high priest is doing for physical, manual labor. And so, they didn't put their shoulder into the work. It's interesting to do a word study on that. In, in the Hebrew, it's actually the same word using for, used for oxen when you put a yoke, of, a yoke you know, for pulling on the oxen and they don't want it and they try to slide back out of it. It's where the English word backsliding came from. The nobles of Tekoa are basically backsliding because they're not putting their necks to the work. Now, it doesn't say why they didn't help. They did live down by one of the negative guys that was a constant protractor we looked at in the last chapter and we'll see in the next. And maybe they were friends with him. And, or maybe they just felt like, you know, I'm up here on my high horse. I'm a noble. I'm of noble birth and I don't need to do the little minion stuff. I don't know what they thought. But they made it into Nehemiah's list. They are eternally known as the ones who didn't do the work. Nehemiah, as much as he bragged about how everyone was working hard, he wasn't the least bit bashful about saying, but these guys, they were too good to do it. They didn't do nothing. Now later in Nehemiah, there are celebrations about the work that's accomplished. Do you suppose that those that didn't partake in the work enjoyed the celebrations the way those that really had? Did you know for the work God's called us to do, there are celebrations coming? You know, there's a day when we, if we don't take part in the work God's called us to do, that we may be there, but there may be celebrations going on that we're not as excited about think about it one of the great philosophers of yesteryear is named Immanuel Kant and he he said many things that are quotable there's a whole list of quotes from this guy if you look it up on the internet but he said this act that act that your principle of action might be safely made a law for the whole world now if you were to phrase that differently you might say Conduct yourself as if everyone did as you do, things would be great. And so let's, let's follow that. As we look here, Nehemiah, everyone's working. Well, almost everyone. Those guys weren't. The nobles of Tekoa. Are you a servant like the high priest? Or are you a noble of Tekoa? Well, if everyone volunteered like you do, would the church be thriving and busy and flourishing? If everyone shared their faith like you do, would the gospel message be going across our area faster than ever? If everyone attended like I do, Would it be evident we really, really need to get this building project going and get some more seats soon because we're kind of crowded? Or if I came, you know, once every month or six weeks just to show I'm still alive while I find other things to do to engage with the Lord on Sabbath, even though it's His day of assembly. And so, 
if everyone at church gave like me. How would that be with the church? That was Emmanuel Kant's idea. Is act that if your principle of action might safely be made a law for the whole world. Act like, I'm not suggesting we do to act these things as laws, but you understand the principle of reflecting on if everyone did this like me, would it be a benefit to God's cause? That is a good question to ask ourselves. And so God has a work for you. I believe that every one of us needs to be involved in two reaches. Actually, there's a third reach in your Sabbath school quarterly where it talks about uh, total member involvement. Since TMI stands for too much information, I tend to like every member involvement in North America. But those of you that don't know this, the Adventist church is a worldwide church with about 19 of our roughly 20 many million members outside the U.S. Did you know that? Yeah. It's been the fastest growing Protestant church in the world uh, off and on for many, many years. And so they talk about in-reach, outreach, and then upreach. Which, I, you know, we don't want to leave that out. Connecting with God would be the upreach, right? But as far as our outward, two things. In-reach. I believe we all need to be of active service in the body of Christ. It's inconceivable that my toe doesn't work for my body. And do whatever it's asked to do by the body. Right? The members of the body, that's the, the parts of the, the, as members of the church, we're the members of the body of Christ. And so we should have an in reach function. Everyone should you say, Well, I don't have an official office. That's fine. There's a five and ten plan. You can start on that today. Okay? And the elders and myself, I, I, I called them this morning. I said, guys, I feel like one of the things we need to be doing more is that, that quote like I shared with you is, is making sure that we have more jobs and ideas and things outlined and thought through for folks to step up and do if they want. But you can start with your 5 and 10 plans right now. And uh, I've seen some of, some of you, 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 you clean up and you're not, you're not official at doing it, but you're cleaning up in the sanctuary after the service. I've noticed that. I've noticed y'all doing that. I, I applaud you for it. And uh, I thank you for it. I've, I've noticed some of you, if somebody drops a little piece of paper on the floor, you won't let it stay there. You're not going to walk by it like 50 other folks might do. You're going to pick it up and toss it. You're going to clean up. You're going to do what you can. There are easy places to start. But I felt impressed this morning. I called and talked to the elders. I wasn't able to get them all, but I left them messages. They texted back. And we want to start meeting and talking about better planning so that those of you that want to find meaningful ministry, that we've done a better job as leadership and making sure you have a place to plug in. Okay? We want to do that. And so, ultimately, we all want to be there and hear those words of Jesus, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's primarily about faithfulness, but it's also about doing something. Well done. When someone says, Good job, well done, that means you've done something, yes or no? We've got a function of inreach in the church and outreach to the community. That can be your neighbor across the street. That can be, uh, we had a member in one of our churches once, I don't know that he was ever brave enough to talk to people, but when I would go in the post office, I would find a track that he left there. If he went in a public restroom, he left a track. If he went to the post office, he left a track. You think he'll hear those words, well done? I believe he will. Even though he wasn't actively uh, giving Bible studies at the time. So God has a work for you. What is it in your heart? Where would God have you plug in? Be thinking and praying about it. Within reach and without reach. And by the way, if you want someone to share your faith with, if you start praying that God would give you someone to do that with, He'll answer that prayer. So don't pray that prayer unless you actually want to share your faith. Because you're going to get the chance, but I encourage you to pray it. And so let's all aim by God's grace and what He does in our hearts, but our willing response to Him to be there in that day to hear those words, well done.